ان الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله We begin today inshallah ta'ala by starting surah al-fajr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَالْفَجْرْ وَلَيَالِ النَّعَشْرْ وَالشَّفْعِ وَالْوَتْرِ وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَسْرْ هَلْ فِي ذَلِكَ قَسَمٌ لِذِي حِجْرْ We spoke about this ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testifying هَلْ فِي ذَلِكَ قَسَمٌ لِذِي حِجْرْ What a huge testification in this is for those who have intelligence. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادٍ Meaning that the testification that Allah Azza wa Jal will destroy those who turn their backs and those who disbelieve in His messengers. And these are the examples. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادٍ إِرَمَ ذَاتِ الْعِمَادِ الَّتِي لَمْ يُخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ And we spoke about the people of Aad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, uh, saying about them in these verses. وَثَمُودَ الَّذِينَ جَابُوا الصَّخْرَ بِالْوَادِ And the people of Thamud. And then here tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to speak about Fir'aun. وَفِرْعَوْنَ ذِي الْأَوْتَادِ I.e. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed and, uh, and finished and ended Fir'aun ذِي الْأَوْتَادِ الَّذِينَ طَغَوْا فِي الْبِلَادِ فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ One of the key words that we're going to be learning about uh, Fir'aun and what he did was this word تُغْيَان طَغَى Right? اِذْهَبْ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَى It's a beautiful ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa and Harun اِذْهَبْ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the pinnacle the essence of the message and the essence of the sin that Fir'aun did was Tughyan, which is injustice. And we said this about, like we said, like killer storms and so on, that, that it's the injustice, the imbalance that causes the storm, that causes the direction, destruction. And when that balance is restored, then these storms come to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is the purpose of the message coming to Fir'aun. The main purpose was his Tughyan. <coughs> tughyan, Tagha, it's a beautiful word in the Arabic language. And they'll say that, you know, they have these, um, there's like a little ditch, right? If there's a ditch and water is filling up in the ditch and it's going up, it's going up, going up, there comes a point where the water overflows. Like if you have in a glass, right? You pour water, pour water. There's a point even where, you know, the water even pops up just a little bit above the rim of the glass, correct? And then put one more drop, and then Tughyan happens. Tughyan. If someone can get me a cup, I'll show you how to do it. Someone go get me a cup. I can get a cup. Because I have some water here. That point... No, the brother's going to get a cup, inshallah. That point where the water overflows is called Tughyan. And that's exactly, now what is Tughyan, what is that injustice, that imbalance, that, you know, that overflowing? There are many different things. And so from the major sins that Fir'aun was, um, was, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought up and mentioned in the Qur'an, number one was his claiming that he was the Lord Most High. His statement, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى And what he said to his congress, uh, ما علمت لكم من إله غيري. He said, I don't know of any Lord for you except myself. And so these statements of Fir'aun number one from the top of his list. <clears throat> okay. Right, it's not a see-through glass. You can't see inside of it. But I'll just show you inshallah ta'ala. It's water. Don't worry about it inshallah. Alright, so you have the waters like right at the tip here. And you pour a little bit more until it gets like right at this. See that? See, it's like right at the tip. Can you see it? And then you just do a little bit more. And then Tughyan happens. Bismillah. <laughs>
until balance is restored. <laughs> So the sins, the major things that Fir'aun was involved in, number one, is claiming that he was Lord. Number two, is that he enslaved and detained Bani Israel. So a whole nation of people that Fir'aun had enslaved them and made them, made them um, into his slaves and, and so on and so forth. So the enslaving of Bani Israel, thirdly, was <coughs> the killing of the children of Bani Israel. And so Fir'aun, what he did, is he had a dream. Either he had a dream or someone had the dream and, and they mentioned this to Fir'aun. He had a dream that a fire had come from, you know, like uh, uh, like Philistine, that area, had come into Egypt and and the fire had killed away all the the, qibt, the, the people of, of Fir'aun, their, uh, their race. And so when they asked about an interpretation, they said that there is a, a child that's going to come from Bani Israel that's going to uh, ruin your kingdomship and take away your empire and so Fir'aun commanded that all the children who were born to uh, Bani Israel that they be killed now this is really you know it's very cynical what Fir'aun like uh, of his sins of the highest level which you'll see repeated again and again is his istikbar his arrogance his arrogance is mentioned in so many uh, so many verses he wanted to, he, his first commandment was that all the children of Bani Israel would be killed. But then if you think about it, if they're killing all the boys who are born, and all the male, adult, all the, the adults, you know, the elderly of Bani Israel are dying, how many years before they've eradicated Bani Israel? If there's, all the boys are being killed, and all the elderly people are dying out, then... Actually, it was his economists that went and spoke to him about this. They said, it's not financially smart to kill all their children. It's bad for business because your manpower will be lost. And therefore, your empire will fall because you've enslaved Bani Israel. You're actually killing all of them. We need them as slaves. And so what Fir'aun did is like, yeah, that's a smart point. For economical reasons, Fir'aun changed the killing of Bani Israel's boys to um, not every year, but every other year. So this is the year that all the boys would be killed. This is the year that they're spared. Harun السلام, was born in the year that the children were spared. And the year when Musa السلام, was born, this is the year that they were going to kill the children. This is the year that they're going to ch kill the children. A lot of people, uh, what I love about uh, the story of of Musa and Fir'aun in the Qur'an is that a lot of what we've spoken about so far about Ad and Thamud and the Qawmi Lut, a lot of it actually is so beautifully given example of in the story of Musa and Fir'aun. And so I'll be taking concepts, re repetition, things that you've learned and you've heard again and again and again. It's going to come up again in this story and I'll be able to give you examples of things that you've learned, principles that you've learned and show you how in this story that these tyrants, they're just repeating what the people that came before them did. And they will continue to repeat again and again and again. One of the key concepts that is repeated is if you remember back where I, where I spoke about the issue of the Mela and the Jamhur, which were the aristocrats or the, the noble of society being that small group of people that run the affairs of everyone else. I gave an analogy of grasshoppers at that time. Grasshoppers and ants. That even though the grasshoppers might be um, uh, fewer in number, that, uh, fewer in number, but they can lead. If there was like grasshopper versus ant, the grasshopper would finish off the ant. But when you bring one billion ants against a grasshopper, can the grasshopper control one billion ants? The answer is yes, he can. Yes, he can. If he's smart enough and he uses these techniques, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes in the Quran, the techniques of, of tyrants. Tyrants and what they use. The three techniques that we mentioned, and I added a fourth one, was number one, they use fear. Fear at the highest level. And that's going to be illustrated again and again in the story of Musa with Fir'aun. Secondly, is to use the technique and, you know, to put people in their place so they don't move is misconceptions. Misconceptions that they'll take the issue of a prophet and then they will reframe his message to something that the people dislike. Such as calling the prophet a liar or calling the prophet a magician 
or calling something else, reframing it and throwing a misconception at the people so that the people are confused and so on. The third thing that we mentioned was that they use uh, fear, then you had um, misconceptions, and then the third one was, someone remember? It was materialism. Materialism. Where the person offers money and wealth and power and prosperity, and you'll see these things coming up again and again and again in the story of Musa with Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this surah many times, sorry, mentions this story many times in the Quran. One of the surahs that speaks a lot about the story of Musa and Fir'aun is Surah Al-Qasas. Surah Al-Qasas. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, says in those verses, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي This was Musa alayhi salam's mother. This is the year that they're killing uh, the boys. Now a lot of times when, um, like say FBI, CSIS or something like that comes knocking on your door, what do they say to you? They say, we just want to talk. Right? They're like, no, no, speak to my lawyer. No, we just want to talk. We just want to, and they stick their foot in the door. They don't want to let you close the door and so on. Now imagine, imagine if these agents were the henchmen of Fir'aun. They would be much more stronger <laughs> physically. Like they're, they're like criminals, the henchmen of Fir'aun. And they're not asking politely and they're not saying, we just want to talk to you. What are they saying? They are barging into the house, searching if you have any children or if any neighbors heard the crying of a baby in your house and they will take that child and take their swords and they will chop the heads off your child. This is what they're doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know how when someone says, you know, I have a big problem. I have a big problem. Well, how big is your problem? Oh, I have an exam coming up. Oh, I have, the you don't have a big problem. Just say you have an issue or you have a situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the test of Bani Israel, وَفِي ذَلِكُمْ بَلَاءٌ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ عَظِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and th in this, it was a, a bala, a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, عظيم, an enormous test from Allah azza that He tested Bani Israel with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, uh, to Ummi Musa. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ He said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you fear for him. Now in the da'wah, in this message, passing on the da'wah, people have fear. And so what do they do in the fear? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her something. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِهِ فِي الْيَمْ If you're afraid for your son, then throw him into the river. Now, if you're a parent, you'll understand a little bit about what's happening here. A parent normally doesn't even let their eyesight off of their child. They go into a store, the child's in a cart, they called social services, the person left their child, and they walked into a store without their child. A parent has that much, you know, protection of the child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling her that if she fears for a child, take the child, put him in a basket, and throw him in the river. And let the water take him. Again, a parent wouldn't even put the child in the water just if it was a swimming um, activity. But this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that if you're afraid, then do this. What did Ummi Musa do? She did that. She put Musa alayhi salam in the, in the basket, sent in, and the story, I'm not I'm telling you the story of uh, Musa alayhi salam in general, like we said, we're going to be focused on Fir'aun, but I'm just giving you these little glimpses and little lessons from the story. She put Musa in the, in the basket. Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he would protect Musa. Musa alayhi salam arrives at the doorstep, the river step, because they have a lake castle. <laughs> they have a river castle that goes on to the river. And so the, uh, Musa alayhi salam arrives at the home of Fir'aun, the baby killer himself. So it's like, it's coming to him. Who's the first person to see Musa alayhi salam? The wife of Fir'aun. The wife of Fir'aun. She picks up Musa, she kisses Musa, and she says, قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ لِي وَلَكَ She said, he is the delight of my eyes and your eyes. And Fir'aun, you know, and, and you, this is a husband-wife lesson that you learn. He wants to please his wife. 
Asiya السلام, didn't have children. Wife of Fir'aun, she didn't have children. And, and this concerned her very much. She was very saddened by this. And now a child was brought to her door. So now the love that, you know, um, her love came out and she wanted to protect Musa. And you'll see that she says, She said, he's the delight of all, my eyes and your eyes. Don't kill him. Like subhanAllah, she's married to the killer. Immediately, second sentence, she's saying, don't kill him. Because they know this child is a Bani Israel child. That he is from the Bani Israel, he's not from the, the Qibt. He's not from them. And so, Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him so much that he wouldn't take the milk of any woman. Until uh, uh, Musa's uh, sister, she's following along, she's seeing what happened. And then she said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that she said, هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ نَاصِحُونَ She said, shall I not tell you of a home that will do kafala for him? Kafala and you know, nursing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mother of Musa alayhi salam came and immediately Musa alayhi salam took mother, uh, milk from his mother. And he's very happy. Fir'aun seeing this, he's like, why is this so? Why, how come no other woman that he would take milk from, but he takes milk from uh, the wife of Fir'aun, uh, sorry, the wife of this woman. And so she said in response to Fir'aun, she said that my milk is very sweet and my smell is very beautiful. All the children love me. And Fir'aun was happy with her response. And so he led her. So now look, she placed her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a theme that you will see when we ask the question, what saves a nation? When the fitna comes down upon them, what will save them? Placing your trust in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times that statement, place your trust in Allah, people don't understand what that means. It means that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised something, even though in the here and now, you might not see that the promise is true. It might seem like, well, you know, you're telling us that at a later time, some good is going to happen to the Muslims or some good is going to happen to Islam. We don't see that happening right now. And so what a person needs to do is have iman and tawakkul, which is belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and placing the trust that if Allah tells me He's going to do something for me, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill what He promised that He will do. And that is tawakkul and it saves the person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, about Ummi Musa. فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ That we returned Musa to his mother. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say to her that, you know, she's going to be, you know, the nurse. He didn't explain the details. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just told put him in the river. So we returned Musa to his mother, كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا so that it would be a delight for her eyes, wala tahzan, and she would not grieve. Because notice, even if Musa is in the home of Fir'aun and she's in the village, she's going to be very sad what happened today. She wants to hear his news all the time. But if she's the nursing mother of Musa, she will always get to be beside him for the rest of his life. In the home of Fir'aun. Imagine this is the nursing mother of, of Fir'aun's uh, you know, the, the boy in Fir'aun's home, so what kind of special status does she get? She's living now in the castle. She's living in the castle and being treated with so much respect. And Musa alayhi salam, you'll see when he went to Median, when he went to Median, for those who are familiar with the story, after he left Egypt and then wanted, uh, uh, wanted to, uh, one, he went to Median and then wanted to return 10 years later back to Egypt. And they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention why he wanted to return, but he took his wife from Median and he said that we're returning back to Egypt. His desire to go back to see his brother, to see his mother, to return back to his land where he grew up and so on. It doesn't mention the details of it, but this is he would be able even to see his nursing mother. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِتَعْلَمَ أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقَّ And so that she would know that the promise of Allah is the truth. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most people don't, don't understand, don't know this. Don't know this. And subhanAllah, there is... <coughs> 
It's very interesting. In Toronto, in Toronto, there is, if you've been downtown, some of you might know this, some of you might not know this. There's a castle in downtown Toronto. There's a castle in downtown Toronto. It's a huge castle on the top of a mountain. It's called Casa Loma. How many people have heard of Casa Loma? Only a few people. Okay, about four or five people. This castle is very famous. In many of the movies that people see, this castle is used. It was like in the X-Men movie and so on and so forth. Their house was Casa Loma. It's in Toronto. What's interesting about Casa Loma, it took three years to build. It was built in at the turn of the century. It was built in the turn of the century by a man who was extremely wealthy. You're talking about like mega millionaire at that time. He had like hydro plant, hydro. He brought like electricity to Toronto and all of these things. Uh, financer, entrepreneur, all of these things. His dream was to live in a castle. His dream was to live in a castle. Go and read his story. It's very interesting. It took them three years to build his castle until today. It's a tourist attraction. He lived in it for nine years before he went bankrupt and he was expelled and he died penniless. The government of Canada worked its way in taxes and they were able to kick him out of the, out of his castle. In order to maintain his knighthood, his honor and nobility, he went, he filed, you know, he sold his house to the, to the government of Canada and then took it over and then they made it into a tourist attraction after that. But it's very interesting how the life of the dunya, all the wealth that he accumulated and compiled just to build a lofty castle, he lives in it for nine years. All those nine years, he's had financial troubles. How did he sleep at night knowing that, you know, all these people wanted, you know, to take this away from him? And after nine years, he comes, you know, and he loses it. This is the hayat dunya. That we look at the person when they have, the, what they're at the top of their game. When someone is at the top of the game, when they're at the highest level of wealth, that's when we look at them. But how many of us look at them five years later on the decline? When they've lost senses, when they can't even walk, when, you know, they're obese and they've got every disease you can think about. And, you know, nobody's talking to them, their family has abandoned them and so on and so forth. Those are just a few years after the height. What do we do once that decline happens? They're like, oh, too bad. We go to the next person. Do you ever notice when there's someone who's very popular in the news, after two, three years, nobody hears about them anymore? Because they begin the decline and nobody cares about them anymore. They move on to the next person who's at the height of the game. And so Fir'aun was at his height in these verses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa alayhi salam is telling Bani Israel that in al arda lillah, that the land that you're, you know, that people covet and worry so, in al arda the land belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't belong to the kuffar. It doesn't belong to this person. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ he allows to inherit this land whomever he wishes from his servants. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the person turns their trust to Allah Azza wa Jal. Musa alayhi salam, as he was growing up and he saw the injustices that were happening to his people. Again, Musa is from Bani Israel. And so he's not from the Qibt, even though he's growing up in the home of Fir'aun. And he sees the injustice again and again and again. A very interesting point and, and a very beautiful point was when Musa alayhi salam, he was once going out in, in, the, in the city and he saw one of the Bani Israel people in a fight with one of the, um, the Egyptians. So the person, Musa alayhi salam, was known to you know, support justice and you know, stand up for this. And so they called Musa alayhi salam, that, that Bani Israel person. He called Musa alayhi salam, come and help me, help me. And so Musa alayhi salam is breaking up in the fight and got very angry. He hit the Egyptian person. He hit him so hard that he killed him. Now, that's giving you a little glimpse of Musa alayhi salam's strength. Musa alayhi salam's strength that he hits a person once and he doesn't knock them out. He kills them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately Musa alayhi salam felt regret for this and did tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repented to Allah azza wa jal. But nobody knew who had killed the person other than that it was a crime punishable by death that an Egyptian would be killed. Nobody's allowed to kill the Egyptians. And that is punishable by, by death. 
The next day, Musa alayhi salam had done tawbah to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah forgave him. The next day, Musa alayhi salam saw the same person from Bani Israel fighting with another person from the Egyptians. And Musa alayhi salam said to, in, uh, said to him, إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيٌّ مُبِينٌ He said, you are like a, a very clear troublemaker. You're, you're a deceit, a de uh, deceptful person. And the beautiful lesson here, and then this person said to Musa, قَالَ أَتُرِيدُ أَن تَقْتُلَنِي كَمَا قَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا بِالْأَمْسِ He said, do you want to kill me like you killed so-and-so last time, like yesterday? And so you can see even this person, he's, uh, he instigates fights. And yet he was from Bani Israel. And then the, the Egyptian who heard this, then the news went out that Musa was the one who killed yesterday. And then someone came to Musa salam and told them, إِنَّ الْمَلَأَ يَأْتَمِرُونَ بِكَ لِيَقْتُلُوكَ The mala, again the word mala comes up, it comes up again and again and again in the story of Fir'aun and وَمَلَأَهُ And his mala, his aristocrats, as we said, the, the grasshopper, the people that are leading that small group of people, the aristocrats, they started plotting to kill, to kill Musa salam. فَخْرُجْ So they said, leave. What's interesting, a lesson that you learn from this is even though as Muslims, nobody, you know, there's always, um, you know, this thing that you have all good and all bad. You know, all Muslims are good and all kuffar are bad, right? This may be like a concept. But you see from Bani Israel, they were not all good. Such as this person who Musa salam said, you're the problem. Even though he was from his own people, he was the problem, this person from Bani Israel. And then you will see, from Fir'aun's people, from the Egyptians, are they all bad? Are they all bad? They're kuffar, but are they, well, they were kuffar, but were they all bad? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them. From the highest level of them was Asya alayhi salam. And she was the wife of Fir'aun. And so it's not all in one sweeping generality that they're all at the same level. Asya alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا امْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بِنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Is it for the believing women? No, it's for the believing men and women, all the believers, till the end of time. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا Their example is Imra'at Fir'aun, the wife of Fir'aun. Because it doesn't matter who you're married to. You can be married to the most noblest person and you can be in hellfire. And you could be... And the most noblest person could be married to you and you can say, you know, vice versa, it goes both ways. We spoke about the wife of Lut and she was in hellfire. And now we're speaking about Fir'aun who was one of the biggest tyrants who ever walked this earth and his wife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made her an example for all believers till the Day of Judgment. When Fir'aun heard that she had believed in Musa, what does he do? Is he going to argue with his wife? He turns to torture. Again, we said there's misconceptions and then fear. Obviously materialism, he's like, oh, we'll give you this. But the, there's misconceptions and then there's fear. And so when Fir'aun heard that she had believed in Musa's Lord, he began punishing her and torturing her. Imagine he's torturing a woman. Not only is he torturing a woman, he's torturing his wife. He's torturing his wife to the point of death. To the point of death. It's not that he tortured her and let her go. He tortured her to the point where she's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nobody to help her. There's nobody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so who did she turn to? She turned to Allah azza wa jal. And so people might think, who's going to help me? Who's going to help me? There's nobody that can help. There's people that can help you, alhamdulillah. But imagine if there's nobody that can help you. You have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بِنِي لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا She said, you know, everybody's worried about building their houses. The number one question that the shaykh get asked these days is, halal mortgages. 
Do you agree? It's like number one question. Yeah, la, la. And when we were growing up, the number one question was the halal meat issue. But we've gotten over that. Camps have been drawn and, you know, the roads have been laid. That's over. The issue now these days, because some people saying it was halal, even though Allah said it was haram. I don't know where they're getting that from. And then the issue of people wanting so desperately to build a house. Asiya wanted to build a house. She wanted to build a house. But not in this world. She said, Rabbi need And she's asking, who is going to build a house for her? Saying, oh Allah, you build the house for me. Where, where do you want the house to be built? On this side of town or that side of town? What, what area of the city do you want to live in? I want to live in Jannah. Okay, you want a house built in Jannah. Where in Jannah? What prime real estate do you want in Jannah? The one closest to you, O oh Allah. She's saying, رَبِّ بِنِّي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ O oh my Lord, build a home for me near to you in Jannah. رَبِّ بِنِّي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And save me and protect me from Fir'aun and his actions. And save me and protect me from Al-Qawm uh, al And save me and protect me from the transgressive, unjust people, which were the henchmen and these mala and these people of Fir'aun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her back to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam, he left, he left Egypt. He took that advice. And when you see Musa alayhi salam, he didn't go back to his home and pack his clothes and, and get a beast to ride and so on and so forth. When he got that news, Musa alayhi salam left. He left. فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّبْ And you see the fear. This, the story is full. You'll see this word fear. And even this is a lesson for me. I, I remembered once that when Musa alayhi salam threw down the staff, sorry, when the, when the magicians threw down their staffs and they became snakes, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى That Musa, in his heart, he felt fear. All of these magicians had thrown this down. You will see also in the story of Musa and, and uh, uh, when Allah told him to go to Fir'aun, he said, وَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَقْتُلُونِ And he said, and I fear that they're going to kill me. And you'll see Musa alayhi salam in this, indeed Fir'aun is, fear is his number one weapon. It's his number one weapon, it's no joke. How much fear he's playing, and this is Musa alayhi salam. When he left from, uh, when he left from, from that area, فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّبْ He left in fear. يَتَرَقَّبْ means that he's like turning his back, he's looking. Uh, like muraqaba that he, he's walking and he's looking in fear. He's walking and then he's looking. Are they following me? Are they following me? So with no food, with no, um, with no preparation, with no riding animal, Musa alayhi salam just left like that. How long do you survive in such a situation? How long do you survive walking into the desert with no food, no clothing, not proper, um, you know, you have no provisions. And so Musa alayhi salam, he went to a, a place near Medya. And he's like collapsed. After all of this, the fear and, and the situation that he was in. And then he saw some people gathering at a water hole. He saw some people with their sheep and their livestock getting the water. And then he saw these two girls, these two women, and they were standing to the side. They were standing to the side and they weren't watering their, their sheep. And so even though Musa salam was in this situation and so tired, and the situ he went to them and he asked them, why aren't you, you know, taking your sheep to... Because he, this um, business of uh, tending to the sheep and taking them to the water and all, it's very difficult work. So you see, there's only men in that area. And he sees two women there, and they're not even allowing their, um, their sheep to, to go forward. And then the women said that they can't, you know, push and shove with the men. They wait till the men finish, and then they try to bet their best to, um, get the water for their sheep. 
And so Musa alayhi salam said that I will get the water for you. Again, that his, his, the, did Musa alayhi salam said, you know, make a deal with them, you're going to pay me this much, or anything like that. He saw these women in, in distress, in need, and even though he was in need, he was still taking care of them. So Musa alayhi salam, he went, and he, um, what the men used to do is they, when they finish their watering, they cover up the hole with a huge rock. And the rock, this watering area, is very difficult to move. Musa alayhi salam in his strength, he's pushing and shoving with the men, moving the rock, and he gets water for, um, for the sheep. Gives it back to the women, and that's it, they're gone. And Musa alayhi salam went down and, and you know, sat down, uh, and then he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لَمَا أَنزَلْتُ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ he said, my Lord, that indeed I am very much in need of your khair to come down upon me. At that time, Musa alayhi salam made that dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine all the situation. And then he lands his dream job. You know how everybody has this dream job that they're thinking of? What's the dream job for you? A lot of people here in Canada, Nortel is the dream job. If you get Nortel, you're set for life, right? Until you get laid off. <laughs> You're set for life if you got that Nortel job. In other places, it's working for Microsoft. In other places, oh, you know, they get this dream job. What, is, what happens when they get their dream job? What happens? They move into suburbia. Very far from the masjid. Not everybody. I'm not saying this is always the case. But in many times, things like this happen. I'm not saying this is the case. It's a ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the person the dream job. And with the dream job comes a big house somewhere in the desert. Or, you know, in Kanata or something like that. <laughs> somewhere out very far. Somewhere very far from it. They're being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's peaceful. It's calm. There's no stress. What do they do with their life? They prepare. <laughs> Musa alayhi salam, these girls, they came and they said, my father, you know, he wants to, you know, the father saw them, he said, how come you came back so early? And they said, this man, he helped us, he's a very strong man and so on. So he sent his daughters to go and bring them, bring this man. And so they brought Musa alayhi salam and they fed him. And then the daughter said, Ya abat istajir, inna khayra man istajart al qawiyul amin. She said, oh my father, hire him. You know, istijara, like ajr, in fact, and here's a tip for you, when you say, al-ajru indallah. When someone says that to you, you get lots of ajr. You get lots of, the translation in English, you frequently get translated is, ajr means reward. But let me give you a, a more interesting um, translation for it. Ajr is rental payment. Ijara, if you have like a ijara contract, it's a rental contract. Ajr is a rental payment. And so what it is, when you say to someone, you get the ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's, it's as if you are doing this action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requested this action, almost like Allah is renting you. Do this action and I will give you such and such. And so you do the deed, you pray Fajr, you pray Lord, you pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, promises you Jannatul Firdaus. This is your ajr for the work, O oh my slave. This is the slave and this is the rental work that the person is doing. Do this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you this. And so it's interesting that when you place your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I just, I just, this came to my mind. I'm just going to share it with you. A lot of times people are like, I'm not going to pray until I understand the purpose. You know, people like that, they're like, I'm not going to wear hijab until I understand the purpose of hijab. Okay, how much are you studying? They're like, what do you mean studying? How many halaga? Because you're saying you're not going to do it until you understand the purpose. Are you really searching out the purpose? And if you look at that, that concept, the person says, I'm not going to obey Allah until I first understand the purpose. Why would Ibrahim salam kill his son Ismail at the commandment of Allah Azza If he had that same principle, I'm not going to kill my son until Allah reveals to me the purpose of killing my son. This would be the same mentality, but that's not what Ibrahim alayhi salam did. Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Inni ra'aytu fil manam, he said to his son, Inni ra'aytu fil manam, anni athbahuka, fandur madha tara. He said, I saw in my dream that I'm slaughtering you, fandur madha tara, what's your opinion about this? Ismail alayhi salam, young boy, 
But he used to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said in response, قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ He said, Oh my father, this is the da'i. He's telling his father, Oh my father, do what Allah commanded you to do. And so who are we to say to Allah Azza wa we're not going to do what you commanded? يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ He said, Oh my, and he saw, it's not go and do what Allah commanded you. The commandment is that he be killed. And so he's saying, يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ He said, you will find me, inshaAllah, God willing, from those who are patient. I will be patient to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding you to do. SubhanAllah. And so now you see, we're talking about the purpose. I'm trying to rewind here. What was I saying? I'm trying to get back on, on track. Okay, the ajr. Inna khayra man istajarta al qawiyu al amin. That the that the best person to do ijara to hire is al qawi al amin. Is the strong one, the amin, the trustworthy one. And again, this is a key principle for you know human resources. When you're looking to hire someone, these are your two principles that you want to look for in a person. You want to find someone trustworthy. And this is like the number one thing that everybody's talking about. Integrity is what they call it. Integrity. How can you hire someone who has 10 PhDs and can make you a billion dollars if the person has no integrity and after he makes you a billion dollars, he's going to steal the billion dollars himself. When you have the example of Enron and many other companies playing with the numbers and stealing. Integrity, right? So, al am having, uh, having that iman, <laughs> having that security. استأجرت القوي Now the قوي is the strong person. And so it's not only that you find some poor soul in the masjid that's very trustworthy and say, hey, come lead my uh, billion dollar business. He's very trustworthy, but he'll collapse your business. Because he's not قوي, he's not strong. And so a person builds their skills with their education, their knowledge, and all of the, they learn all of those skills. On top of that, you add integrity. And you have the perfect mix. It's interesting, it is said, and you see this in um, like the explanation stories of the prophets. The father of this, of, of one of the daughters from Median, he said to her, how do you know he's Amin? How do you know he's Amin? How do you know that he's trustworthy? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and, and let us learn many examples from this inshaAllah ta'ala. And this is going to be used against you inshaAllah, so pay attention. <laughs> Musa alayhi said, when she went back, they went back to call Musa alayhi to come to their home. What did Musa alayhi do to her? He told her to walk behind him. He told her to walk behind him. Now she's the one leading the way. But she would just like, you know, like throw a rock in this direction, throw a rock in that direction, and you go in this direction or go in that direction. Why did he do that? Alayhi salam. So that he wouldn't walk behind a woman and, and her body would be showing. Her clothing would show and so on and so forth the whole, the whole time and he's not married to her. This is not his mahram. And he's a prophet of Allah. And so he said, I'll walk with you but you walk behind me. So that to protect her modesty and to protect her and so on and so forth. From this, she concluded that this was a person of integrity. This was a person of am. And so she said to her father, hire him. And so her father hired him. And so he landed the dream job. It's like eight years or ten years that he would work with him and that he would marry one of his daughters. So normally people in their list is they want to get the job and then they want to get married. These are like the dreams. You tell a person, what are your number one goals? Number one, land the dream job. Number two, get married. And sometimes they're reversed. Right? Get married and then land the dream job. No one will marry this person. So they have to get the dream job first and then get married. In one night... In one night, Musa alayhi made this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that night, he was offered the dream job, a place of relaxation, a place of calm, a place where he would, you know, every night he's sleeping under the stars, preparing for this mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send him on. And he got married to such a righteous woman. And this is the wife of Musa alayhi After about eight years, between eight or ten years, Musa alayhi had that desire built up in him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in his heart the desire to return back to Egypt. And subhanAllah, as you see this built up, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prepared Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when, when Musa alayhi salam, um, uh, when Allah azza wa ta'ala spoke to Musa, Allah azza wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَاصْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِ وَاصْطَنَعْتُكَ uh, Sana'a is manufacturing. Sana'a is manufacturing. So if you have a manufacturing plant, it's like a masna'a. It's a masna, a manufacturing plan. You take one product, you put the ingredients in together and it comes out something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa, وَاصْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِي That I manufactured you for myself. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these tests, all of the preparations, everything that he had been through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is manufacturing all of these gifts that Musa alayhi salam had been given so that he would be that servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah Azrael had a mission for Musa alayhi salam. And when they're traveling through the desert, Musa alayhi salam, it's, it's very dark. Obviously there's no street lights, there's nothing like that. It's just the darkness. And then they went to um, Turi Sayna. This is Turi Sayna, right? And then at that place, Musa alayhi salam saw a fire. And so he told his wife, he told her, stay here. I'm going to that fire. Either I will get directions from that area or I will, you know, get one of the embers, like take one of the flames and come back and, you know, we can benefit from that. And then when Musa alayhi salam entered that area, subhanAllah, even as preparing this, Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to Musa. He spoke to Musa. Musa alayhi salam came into that area and Allah Azza just spoke to Musa. Inni ana rabbuk. I'm your Lord. Fakhlana alayk. Take your sandals off. Innaka bil wadil muqaddasi tuwa. That you are in the holy land of tuwa. The pure land. Wa ana akhtartuka. And I chose you. Fastami' lima yuha. So listen carefully to what is going to be revealed to you. Inni ana Allah. La ilaha illa ana. Fa'budni. Aqim salat ala dhikri. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God except me. So worship me and establish the salah for my remembrance. This is in Surah Taha. And it's right at the beginning of the surah and you can read about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his discussion and speaking to Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam was commanded to return back to Fir'aun. And we've, we've, um, went a little bit, I'm telling you a little bit more of the story. Inshallah ta'ala, I hope and pray that you can learn the story in more detail. What we're focusing on is Fir'aun wa mala'ahu. Fir'aun and his mala, his aristocrats and, you know, the high class of the society and how they held the people, um, under their oppression. The, the staff of Musa alayhi salam, the staff, Allah, he had a staff uh, in his hand. Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى what you, What's in your hand, O Musa? It, it was in the discussion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to throw it down. He threw it down, it became a snake, and then he became afraid, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him not to be afraid. In this, and you'll see even, uh, there's again, there's so many lessons that you can learn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like a, a pretest that this staff of Musa alayhi salam is going to be used to turn into a snake later on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing Musa alayhi salam the strength of what he has in his hand from that time. And even later on when the, the magicians threw down their, their sticks and so on and, and you know they um, did their illusions and so on, Musa alayhi salam had fear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, don't fear and throw down your staff. And it became a snake. And it swallowed all the other snakes. When Musa alayhi salam um, returned to Fir'aun, the dialogue, if when, it, when a person wants to give da'wah, and this is a beautiful um, point to, to mention here, a lot of people when they want to give da'wah, you tell the people, learn the Qur'an, and teach the people Qur'an. People and the youth, and I'm sure in other places as well, North America, we grew up like this, thinking that the Qur'an is only for people who believe in the Qur'an. 
that the message is there, like it tells you pray, fast, and so on, and you're not going to listen to it until you actually believe in the Qur'an. So how are you going to believe in the Qur'an? They're like, oh, you've got to go into the you know, sciences and discover things first, and then come with blind faith to the Qur'an. It's just this whole setup is not correct. The Qur'an is revealed to guide the people to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when a person says, Oh, I want to give da'wah, I'm going to go learn the Bible so that I can give da'wah to people. No, go and learn the Qur'an. And then the person will say, but they don't believe in the Qur'an. The Qur'an was revealed for everybody. And it is kafa, it is enough for you to take that Qur'an, learn the lesson. So you would wonder, how is that possible? And here's a beautiful example of this. You meet someone who, let's say for example, they're a Hindu. They worship other, um, other gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They worship multiple gods. And you're thinking that, oh, I need to go to the Hindu scriptures to learn about this so I can give them da'wah. In the Qur'an, how many people were mushrikeen? Ad, Thamud, you know, uh, Fir'aun's people, they're worshipping Fir'aun. You had idolaters in the mushrikeen of Mecca. They all worshipped idols. All these verses are revealed to guide them to Allah Azza wa Jal. To guide them to them. And so you will see that Musa alayhi salam, in his dialogue with Fir'aun, Fir'aun is using different techniques. In one of the techniques, he calls Musa a magician. In one of the techniques, he says to, uh, to Musa that he's going to throw him in prison if he doesn't stop this. And he uses these techniques and you will see how Musa alayhi salam, responds to each one as it comes. You know, it's interesting because I can keep going on and on there. We still have the story of the magicians, the story of, you know, the, the, uh, the nine signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the parting of the sea, and there's lots that, that's there. Um, I just hope inshallah ta'ala that when I just mention, you know, the story of the magicians, hopefully you understand what I'm talking about when I say the story of magicians. The, the, the magicians, when, when Musa alayhi salam came to Fir'aun, and, and he started the, the dialogue. It's very interesting the techniques Fir'aun used against Musa alayhi salam. Brother, you want to <laughs> move up inshallah ta'ala? You're, you're tired? Okay, no problem inshallah. Khair, inshallah. Khair, inshallah. <coughs> so, Musa alayhi salam, when he went to Fir'aun and he said, and arsil ma inni, uh, he said, I'm the messenger of Allah. Uh, and arsil ma'ya bani israel let bani israel go with me now let like let them go like they're in in enslavement i want to take bani israel and we're going to leave egypt from here we're going to move out so now uh fir'aun starts using t- the techniques again using techniques against musa alayhi salam of these techniques he says to him Alam no rabbika fina walida. Didn't we raise you as a young child? So now you'll see if you've ever tried, you know, you grew up in a, in a, in a community and then later on you grew older, you studied Islam, then you go to the community and try guiding the people to, to Islam. They're like, who do you think you are? You're just a little butcha growing up in this community. They're like, we changed your diapers. And now you're coming and telling us what Islam is. We knew Islam, you know, before you were born. It's a technique. That's not the truth. Like, like that, that, the fact that you change this person's diapers doesn't mean that you have the truth and this person doesn't. But it's a technique that you'll see even Fir'aun used against Musa a.s. He said that, weren't you the little boy that grew up in our house? And so he's trying to humiliate him. He's trying to show what the position is. So he's using the sarcasm and humiliation. He's also saying to, uh, to Musa, right at the very beginning, he's saying, didn't you kill someone? And he said, and killing is kufr. And you see, even in the verses, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Fir'aun said this to him. He said, uh, nafsan. Right? He said, you killed someone, uh, and then, uh, you were one of the kufar. It's just like, how can you come and tell me what religion is, what iman is, when you yourself murdered someone, and, and, and that's disbelief. That is kufr. So you can see right from the beginning, the smear campaign, Fir'aun, intelligent in the dunya sense, he's bringing all these points to humiliate Musa using sarcasm, using, you know, putting him down and, um, and putting his favors. Didn't we raise you? Weren't you the one who, th- we gave this to them, you gave, it? and now you're coming to tell us? 
Musa also had the label placed on him um, in Fir'aun in one ayah Fir'aun says to his mala as soon as Musa is speaking he's like listen to this guy first thing he said ala tasma'un right he's like listen to what he's saying and then Musa is telling him about Allah and Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghribi and so on and then he Fir'aun is saying inna rasulakum alladhi ursila ilaykum lamajnoon he said the lord that has been sent to you is crazy they've lost their mind and we've seen this repeated again in other verses Fir'aun called him uh, you're just no one, you're just a human being like us, and you're just someone who practices magic. Just someone that practices magic. And this is like day one of his da'wah to uh, Fir'aun. The techniques, we said the fear tactics. When the fear isn't necessarily the first thing, the first thing that Fir'aun used with used was the materialism. So he's reminding him of his blessings, didn't we do this, didn't we do that? Secondly, he's using misconceptions. He said, Were, didn't you kill someone? Everybody knew that Musa had killed that person. He's like, that's kufr, and so therefore you're a kafir. And so the misconceptions, after the misconceptions, then he responds with, and misconceptions that he's a magician. As soon as Musa salam, threw down his staff, and you know, and everybody saw, you know, it was, uh, and then he t pulled his hand out and it was completely white. So it wasn't black magic. It was a nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. Fir'aun immediately said, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مِنَ الْمُسَحَّرِينَ He said, you're one of the magicians. Immediately. And then Fir'aun said, not only did he say that, but he said that you've come to change the people's religion and take them out of their lands. So he said that your actual, your agenda and your intentions, they, they just flip it. If you've ever seen Muslims when they go on trial in these, you know, these, um, these joke trials that happen, a Muslim gets detained, they'll say this person is, you know, they're being charged for fraud. And they're like, what happened? They're like, their check bounced. The check bound. They went to a grocery store one time and they didn't have enough money in their account. And so they're being expelled from the country because of, you know, uh, financial fraud or something like this. Big words, but they just play, play things around. There was one brother, I think, you know, uh, he was recorded on file. They have this in the court papers and they used it against them that he said, Allahu Akbar. I mean, you're thinking, okay, so they said, because he said Allahu Akbar, therefore, He's planning some terrorist attack. They're like, do you realize what we say in the Adhan? <laughs> do you realize what we say in every movement of our Salah? You know, but then they take that word and then they say, you know, they just turn it around and they'll say every time someone does a suicide bomber, they say Allahu Akbar. So any Muslim who says this word, this is a sign that they're training for such, such actions and so on. Misconceptions. And then the mala, they just pass this around so much so that, and I remember there, there was in a, in a security place, one brother, this is in California, they had instructions that if anybody says Allahu Akbar in public, they would shoot him on sight. Because they would assume that this person is about to um, do some suicide mission or something like that. So be very careful and start giving more da'wah so you educate the people about these things. Misconceptions, and this is what Fir'aun is doing. And then finally the fear. When he saw as each point, Musa alayhi if you see what Musa alayhi is saying, all his statements are full of wisdom, full of hikmah, full of guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fir'aun's statements are like swear words. Oh, he's a magician. Oh, he's crazy. Oh, he's this. He's not saying anything uh, intelligent. And so Fir'aun, it was actually against the law that anyone would worship other than Fir'aun. You'd be imprisoned. If you went and got a different idol, you'd be in big trouble. So he said, If you take any other Lord other than me, I will make you one of those who are imprisoned. And this is a very famous tactic in many Muslim countries around the world. That's step number one. If you don't listen to government or this tyrant or that tyrant, jail is number one on the list. Jail is number one on the list and then it, it moves on to other things. When they have people that don't listen to what they want.
I want to um, just read to you Musa alayhi salam's response to Fir'aun when he said that you killed one of these um, people and that's kufr and therefore you're kafir. Uh, Musa alayhi salam said, قَالَ فَعَلْتُهَا إِذًا وَأَنَا مِنَ الضَّالِّينَ فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ لَمَّا خِفْتُكُمْ فَوَهَبَ لِي رَبِّي حُكْمًا وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ أَنْ عَبَّدْتَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ such beautiful hikmah is da'wah to you, Fir'aun. He says to him, Qala fa'altuha. He said, I did it. Wa ana min al-dalin. And I was of those who was ignorant at that time. Wa ana min al-dalin. Fa farartu minkum lamma khiftukum. So I ran away from you when I feared you. Fa wahaba li rabbi hukma. So Allah gave me as a gift, uh, hukma, right? This, um, Religious knowledge and you know right judgment of affairs in this prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a prophet. Fawahabali Rabbi Hukma wa Ja'alani min al Mursaleen and made me one of those as the appointed messengers of his. Watilka ni'matun tamunnuha alay and he said, and this is a past favor, tamunnuha alay, like when you give someone a gift and then you tell the person, Didn't I give you this, didn't I give you that? It's it's not generosity. When you do this. And now he's reminding him of these favors to say to him, وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّ is Because of this past favor, is that why you enslaved Bani Israel? Is that the reason that gives you the right to enslave Bani Israel? Showing that it has nothing to do with the issue. So he answered his issue and then brought him to what they're really discussing here. وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ أَنْ عَبَّدْتَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلٍ قَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ وَمَا رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ and then Fir'aun, then the dialogue goes into who is the Lord of the worlds. And then Musa alayhi salam explains who is, um, who is the Lord of the worlds. After Musa alayhi salam said that, one of the things that Fir'aun also said to him, again, misconceptions, he said, قَالَ فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى He said, what about the nations that came before? This issue of, you know, the, the nations that came before, again, you will see this coming up again and again and again. There was, um, there was one sister, she converted to Islam and, I, and uh, reverted to Islam and I asked her about her parents, whether she felt bad to leave the religion of her forefathers and so on. And, and then she said, no, my parents don't worship. They're just like no religion type people. And that's interesting here in this city, that's like 20% of the population. They, their parents have no religion that they're worried that they're going to change the religion of their forefathers. It's a very like big point with people. They want to become Muslim, but they're like, but I'm going to be changing the religion of my forefathers, the religion of my parents and their parents and so on and so forth. They would keep bringing this up. And we saw this with multiple nations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed. They'd say, oh, we don't want to change the religion of our forefathers. So Fir'aun said this, قَالَ فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى He's saying in front of everybody, what about the nations that came before? Because Musa alayhi salam, they used to worship idols, they used to worship, you know, human gods and so on and so forth. So if you said they're in hellfire, then everybody's going to, and, and they are, everybody's going to say that, oh, you know what, this religion is, uh, we're not going to follow Musa because he's insulting our fathers, insulting our heritage. And now Musa can't say, he can't lie and say that, oh, you know what, they were on guidance. So Musa alayhi salam said, قَالَ عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي فِي كِتَابَ لَا يَضِلُّ رَبِّي وَلَا يَنْسَى He said, knowledge of the past generations is with my Lord. لَا يَضِلُّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not misguided. وَلَا يَنْسَى And he doesn't forget. And so he took them back to Tawheed, explaining who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then Fir'aun, he came to the conclusion, you know, he's saying to everybody, Musa is, is a magician. This is the ultimate misconception. He chose it and he said, فَلَا نَأْتِيَنَّكَ بِسِحْرٍ مِثْلِهِ He said, you're a magician, or we're going to bring magicians just like you. So it's like, it's not even open to discussion. He's saying that not only you're a magician, but we're going to bring the magicians out and then we'll have a competition between you and the magicians so they can show you who is like, who is for real and everybody will know. And so again, something called presuppositions. When you make a statement to someone, you say something like, um, why, why are you such a bad magician? <laughs> why are Muslims good magicians? What does that presuppose? It presupposes that Muslims are magicians, they're just playing tricks. 
right? And if you say, well, Muslims are, and you try to answering that question, why are Muslims so violent? That, and if you start answering the question, you've already made the mistake. You say, why, let me ask you this question, why are Muslims so violent? And you'd say, well, in order to understand why Muslims are so violent, you have to first, you're already assuming the question, it's a, they call it a loaded question. Meaning, it's, you're already being labeled by the way the question is being said. Right? And, and it's, it's a, um, it's a propaganda technique. And it's used again and again and again. It programs the mind to already come to a conclusion about the person. Even before the answer is even, um, is even said. The, the magicians at the time of Fir'aun, were very high status people, right? If this was a magician, you're talking about they are in aristocrat society level, right? They're at the highest level. <coughs> and when they came to Fir'aun, Fir'aun, um, they said to Fir'aun, if we win, right? We'll, uh, they said, are, are we going to get some sort of reward? So the materialism factor, so now they're, and, and you will see in fact the magicians, Musa alayhi gave da'wah to them before the competition. He said, uh, He said, woe to you, don't make a lie against Allah. Because you know, they, they know they're just doing like this magic, and so there's no, there should be no lie. <coughs> you want to just... Uh, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> you give them the papers, inshallah ta'ala. Wazza'ah. If you guys can move up, inshallah. Are, is your back hurting? Move up. <laughs> I'm very sensitive. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me less sensitive then. <laughs> Yeah, the paper that's going around, that's for the missed and mailing list, correct? It's for the missed and mailing list. Okay, so for future programs, inshallah ta'ala, if you'd like to be um, informed about what's going on in masjid here, inshallah ta'ala, that's the, the list that's going around. <coughs> the magicians of Fir'aun, they, they asked for the ajr, are we going to get some special prize? And Fir'aun said, qala na'am. He said, you will have this. وَإِنَّكُمْ إِذًا لَمِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ he said, not only, because when we said materialism, what are we talking about when we're saying materialism? Materialism is not just power of wealth. It's power of, um, like political power. That you would have high status. That you'd be able to do things and say things. So Fir'aun is saying to them two things. Number one, yes, you will have a huge prize if you win. And number two, is that I will bring you even closer to me. So they will get even higher status in the kingdom of Fir'aun. And so with these things, Musa alayhi salam is now up in competition against these uh, magicians. The magicians, subhanAllah, we learned the lesson. Again, we said perish nations. We've been speaking about nations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed. One of the, the worst people in the, um, the kingdom of Fir'aun were the magicians. They misguided everybody. With their magic, they'd fear people and put spells and so on. They fear them. They were the worst of people. And then, because of this incident, they became the best of people. The best of people. So much so that they, like, you know, when you give da'wah to someone, you expect that as soon as you give da'wah, they're gonna become Muslim, right away. If that was the case, they have an amazing, this is like the example of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I'm the messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Muslim. In response, no questions asked. This is the example of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and it's brought up many times of his fadl amongst the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his virtue. And then you look at the magicians of Fir'aun. Musa alayhi salam spoke to them before the, um, uh, before the event and they decided to go forward with it. They said that they're going to do it. They said uh, either you throw or we throw. They, the, Musa alayhi salam said to them, that they throw. So all these magicians, it's Musa versus all the magicians. They throw down their staffs and they can't make their staffs into real snakes. If you didn't know this. All they can do is illusions. 
they have another snake, they throw a staff and you didn't see the stick thrown or something like that. And just this fate, you know, a snake comes out or something and so on. But it's very scary. And the people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the people were scared. Musa alayhi salam was scared at that, at that incident. He had fear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we said to him, don't be afraid. Musa alayhi salam commanded to throw his staff. As you know, he threw down his staff. It became a huge snake. And in front of all the people, all the Egyptians that are watching, all of Bani Israel, all the mala in front of Fir'aun, the snake ate all the other snakes. What happened? All the magicians prostrated. They did sajda. They didn't do sajda to Musa. They said sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They all prostrated to Allah Azza wa Jal. قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ They said, we believe in the Lord of Al-Alameen, Rabbi Musa wa Harun. So that it's clear because Fir'aun was telling the people, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى I'm your Lord Most High. And everybody was saying, oh, we believe in the Lord Most High. And Fir'aun is going around telling everybody that he's that person. He's the Lord Most High. And then they said, Rabbi Musa wa Harun. We believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. And so they became the best of people in one day. In one day they became the best of people. Mentioned in the Quran, an example for till the day of judgment. We read these verses and we hope for the ajr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we read their lives. So never lose hope in someone. Even if they're a magician at the highest level of government and misguiding all these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can still guide them. Can still guide them. Allah guides and we don't guide. In this situation, when they prostrate, everybody saw the snakes eating. It was a miracle from Allah Azza wa Jal. And we said about the miracles, what did Thamud do when they saw the miracle? They disbelieved in, in, uh, in Salih alayhi salam, even though they saw the, the she-camel, Naqatullah. And now we see in this situation, what did the people of Fir'aun do? Did they believe? They just saw the miracle right there. But yet they kept quiet. They're waiting for Fir'aun to give them permission to believe in, in the Lord. He didn't give permission. Immediately Fir'aun started accusing them. He said, this was a plot. And he said, and not only is it a plot, he said that all the magicians have teamed up with Musa. They're on his side. He said, Inna, uh, Inna He said that Musa is your chief. He's your big man who taught you guys the magic. And you guys did this and you set this up and this all was a big show to misguide all the people. And so when Fir'aun said this, and even he said, SubhanAllah, you see the arrogance. قَالَ آمَنْتُمْ لَهُ قَبْلَ أَنْ آذَنَ لَكُمْ He said, have you believed in him before I gave you permission? Like look at what he did to them. He enslaved them. They're not even allowed to believe in something until he gives them the permission to believe in something. And you'll see even subhanAllah, the mushrikeen in Mecca, like when Bilal radiallahu anhu became Muslim, they were like, how dare he become Muslim without getting our permission first? He's our slave. How dare our slaves have their own say and their own opinion of what they believe in? And they tortured Bilal radiallahu anhu because of that. And here you see this Fir'aun say this. SubhanAllah, the, um, the response. SubhanAllah, there's so much to... <laughs> Not too much time left, but their, their response was so amazing. It's in Surah Taha. I hope inshallah ta'ala you go. If we don't get time to finish it today, go into Surah Taha and recite what the magician said to Fir'aun. There's different statements of response that they said to Fir'aun. One of the key things they said, they said to Fir'aun that we don't care about what you're going to do. We don't care. They said, فَقْضِ مَا أَنْتَ قَاضِ إِنَّمَا تَقْضِ هَذِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا they said, make your judgment because you're not a judge. You are only a judge of this life. You're only a judge of this life. And so whenever, you know, someone's worried, oh, I'm going to go to jail. Oh, this is going to happen. What can they do to you? They can only, they can only maybe bring you some um, discomfort in this dunya. And then that's it. As one of the companions, radiallahu anhum, the king wanted to, you know, he's trying to do everything. He's, you know, sends a woman to misguide him, his, uh, fee, you know, hunger, he takes the food away, and throws fear on the person, and, and this companion's like not moving. And then in the end, he said, that's it, I've had it with him, 
go and throw him in, in the burning fire and throw two of his companion friends before him. So he saw his, his brothers, the Muslim brothers being thrown into this burning oil and they're being burned alive. Another person burned alive. He hears they're screaming and then he starts crying. And then they told the king he's crying. So he said, bring him back. He said, he said, that's it. You want to become like Christian? You wanted like everything like this? And the man said, no. <laughs> he's like, I will not change my will, all of this. So then the king said, then why are you crying? He said, I'm crying because, subhanAllah, I only have one soul. You can only kill me once. That's why I'm crying. He said, because after this, I'm, you know, it's to the hereafter. He said, I wish that I had a thousand souls. That you could keep doing this again and again and again so that I keep dying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the king said, you know, like there's no hope with these people. There's nothing they can do to you. It's only their hayat al dunya. It's only their hayat al dunya. And why don't they kill the people? If they kill them, then they would just be finished with them so quickly. They want to, they want to torture them for some time. They want to torture them. SubhanAllah. The tunnel vision, one of the things Fir'aun, when everybody started, you know, this, this talk. Now, the Egyptians did not believe in Musa, even though they saw the sign. They decided instead to follow Fir'aun. What was the consequence of that? They drowned with Fir'aun. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the sea back together, that was their end. And had they believed in Musa alayhi salam, they would have had a different end, an end in Jannah. But they were cowards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوا That Fir'aun deceived his people and they believed him. They're not courageous people. They're like slave mentality. Anything Fir'aun tells them, yes sir, whatever you say sir, yes boss, you're the, you know, just let us know. And then they followed that. This was their mentality. They didn't have the courageous men, um, desire to stand up to tyrant rulers and say this is not correct and this is not correct and so on. There's an interesting ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is actually mentioned a lot about the Prophet sallallahu character. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you were harsh, harsh-hearted with the companions radiallahu anhum, لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ They would have dispersed from you. Um, Shaykh Jafar Idris, he said, a be- I learned this from him, it's so beautiful. He said, this verse is often quoted in praise of the Prophet ﷺ. And indeed it is. But a lot of people don't realize that this is in praise also of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They were courageous men and women who would not stand for anybody to treat them badly. They won't stand for it. So imagine for example, if someone came up into, into a lecture and started insulting you. Oh foolish Muslims, oh misguided, oh this, oh that. What do Muslims normally do? Just sit quietly and listen. As if like they're in detention and this is the principal giving them, you know, the beating with the stick. And they just sit quietly and then nobody says anything. But then you have another group of people, if someone spoke up like that, and I've been in communities, usually it's in America, African American communities, you get a speaker who speaks like that, they're not going to stand for it. Someone will speak up during the lecture. They will speak up during the lecture and they will like, they will not allow for someone to speak to them like this. And usually there's a mix ma- uh, mismatch. Sometimes you have an Arabic speaker, African American community, and, then, and there's a crisscross of, of like cultures. And this is, you know, even from the nobility of the people, they do not allow for a speaker to speak badly of them like this. Do you see what I'm saying? The companions, radiallahu anhum, in their high character, would not allow someone to speak like this. And so similarly, if someone is harsh hearted in their da'wah, they can get a group of, a following of people. A, fo- a people who have feeble minds and are not courageous. Slave mentality. They'll just listen to the boss. It is possible to get followers like that. But followers who are courageous and stand up that even though the person said this, they say, you know, we disagree on this issue or we disagree on that issue. And it's, you know, in respect that the person, you know, just to be courageous, move forward. Fir'aun, as everybody started saying, you know, the Lord of... Uh, the Lord of Musa, Rabbul Alameen, and so on. Fir'aun is like, it's oh, subhanAllah, almost like he's looking out for the people. And he says to them, مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرِ He's like, I don't know of any other Lord for you except me. 
And then so he said, Haman is his prime minister. Haman is the prime minister of Fir'aun. He said, Ya Haman ibn li sarhan. La'alli... La'alli ish? Ablug al-asbab. Asbab al-samawati fa'attali'a ilahi Musa. Wa inni la'adhunnuhu kadiba. He said, so even Fir'aun is saying like, okay, let's take this scientifically, let's take this logically. Haman, build for me a huge tower. So that I will climb the tower and I'll look in the heavens. And I'll see if this God that Musa السلام, is claiming is true or not. And so the, he's a reasonable guy, right? <laughs> How long does it take to build a tower like that? A good 20 years before it's built? Right? Ibn Ali Sarha, like make this Sarha, make this huge tower, and then I will look and then I'll see, see there's no God here, and everybody above the clouds, there's no God there. And then he, you know, he's trying to be scientific. This is like, subhanAllah, tunnel vision, like blindness. And even Fir'aun, he already has his hypothesis. I already assume him to be one of the liars. And SubhanAllah, even when um, Haman, you will see that Allah Azza wa frequently mentions Fir'aun and Haman. Haman is like the prime minister. And you know, he's like, you know, right beside Fir'aun and Fir'aun will say something and you know, he's telling, you know, let Musa and, and his people go. And Haman will say, uh, Musa, uh, wa He said, are you gonna just let Musa go and, um, and his people and he's going to spread corruption in the land and he's going to humiliate you and your, and you know, uh, and your idols. And, and Fir'aun's like, you know, that's what I was thinking. They can't let them go. They have to kill them. And so you see that initially they let the nine signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa with. Nine signs. Someone know the nine signs? Fi tis'i ayatin. In nine signs. Who knows it? You have to see all of them. All of them one shot. <laughs> Okay, ready for this. O ye who take notes. O ye who take notes. Those who don't take notes, how will you ever learn this? Al Asa, Al Yad, Al Sini, Naqsum, and Thamarat. So those are four. And I learned this from someone very special. Al <laughs> Asa is the staff of Musa alayhi salam. Al Yad, his hand. It wasn't black magic, it was a nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in his hand so everybody would see. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As-Sinin. As-Sinin is um, that uh, they had like a drought that, that came to them. Sinin is drought. Is that translation? Okay, a tufan is coming up. As-Sinin, like a drought. Naqsu min al-thamarat. Their uh, economic situation went down. The economy is bad. Economy is bad. Their economy went down. Their thamarat, their fruits, they were not bearing fruit the way it was uh, before. So the, the, there's four there. At-Tufan, At-Tufan uh, was the flooding. Al-Jarad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent locusts amongst them. Right? So they, even when a person has a crop, how can they protect the crops from the locusts? The locusts destroy crops. Al-Jarad, Al-Qummala, which was the lice. The lice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inflicted them with lice. So you're talking about like sicknesses. Usually when people get lice, they're like, oh, you know what, West Nile. The, the, nobody attributes things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they return to Allah. So everything is medicine, medicine, medicine. What kind of medication do we need and this and that. And so Al-Jarad, Al-Qummal, they had the, the Qummal, the lice came to them in their, in their heads. Al-Dafada, the frogs, they were infested with frogs. They were infested with frogs. Al-Jarad al-Qummala wa al And when we say this, these are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just that they had frogs. It's a sign from Allah azza wa jal. What kind of frogs? What kind of lice? What kind of naqsum min al-thamarat? The, the, the crops not coming out. Qummala wa al-dafadi'ah wa dama And the blood. Their water was turned to blood. Ayatim mufassalat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent these ayat. If Fir'aun is not going to allow Bani Israel to leave, then this is what's coming to them. Until finally Fir'aun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he told Musa alayhi salam, make your, um, uh, ask your Lord to make this go away. 
And subhanAllah, even they asked Musa, make dua to your Lord that this will go away. I thought you didn't believe in his Lord. And now they're telling Musa that, you know, we've been cursed by you and your people. Ask your Lord, and then if you do this and it goes away, then we'll let you go. And then reluctantly they let them go. And then when they let them go, then they sent their henchmen out. They're like, we can't let them spread mischief to our neighbors. So we gotta, we gotta extradite them again, right? They gotta go to their neighbors and go and kill them somewhere else. And then they chase them after that, planning to slaughter all of them at the sea. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, that the arrogance of Fir'aun in many of the verses, one of these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about sending Musa alayhi salam and Harun, إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلَئِهِ فَاسْتَكْبَرُوا وَكَانُوا قَوْمًا عَالِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we sent him to Fir'aun and his chiefs. So you see the translation, they say chiefs, or the aristocrats, or the high class society of, of their, you know, their, um, in their place. To Fir'aun and his chiefs, his mala, fastakbaru. So they, they became arrogant, right? Fastakbaru, wa kanu qawman alin, and they were an arrogant people. So, istikbar, like kibir, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what is kibir? What is arrogance? Arrogant, because someone might like to have nice clothing. Is that arrogance if someone wears nice clothing? What if someone has a nice car? Is that arrogance? Do you like to have a nice car? Everybody has to have like a nice car. Nice, nice stuff and, and so on and so forth. That's not arrogance. A lot of people misunderstand this thing. They're like, anybody who has a nice car is arrogant. That's not true. A person can look beautiful and they can have, you know, nice, you know, they comb their hair nicely and they're wearing clean clothes and so on and so forth. This is not kibir. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful, Allah is beauty and loves beauty. Yuhibbul jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves things to be beautiful. Even when I go to the masjid, mashallah, this masjid is very beautiful. Some masjids you go to, they're not so beautiful. And some masjids you go to, they're very beautiful. What is this a reflection? It's a reflection of the caretakers of the masjid. And so a person wants to beautify their masjid. Nobody's saying that you have to get fancy gold laden and so on and so forth. But it has to be clean. And the people who come to the masjid also should take care to keep the masjid of Allah clean. That's not arrogance. This is the beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves beauty. <clears throat> arrogance, kibir, is batrul haqq. As the Prophet ﷺ said, to reject the truth. وَغَمْطُ nas And to humiliate people. بَطْرُ الْحَقْ وَغَمْطُ nas. So if the, person, the truth comes to the person, they know it's the truth, and they reject it. So someone will say, oh, I know this is truth, but I just, I can't uh, leave my alcohol. I can't, you know, leave this. I can't do that. I'm, that's, that's kibir. When the person has pushed away the truth, this is kibir. And غمط nas is to humiliate people. And this issue of humiliating people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. As you can see, many of the comedians, many of the, um, uh, the society, it's built on sarcastic humiliation of other people. Many of the shows that you see on TV, it's built on making fun of others. This is just the way the culture is, like mocking and so on. Every time two people are friends, subhanAllah and, and may Allah protect us, when they become good friends, they begin to mock each other. When they become good friends. It's like a sign of good friendship that you humiliate and put your friend down. And usually when they're not friends, then they don't say anything to each other and so on and so forth. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Obviously when you're very close to someone, maybe you can say things to them that uh, it's okay. But you, like some people, they'll go to someone else and they're like, oh, you're not married? And then they laugh. And the person that you're saying to, maybe the person who's saying this, they're married, so they don't understand the weight of the pain, that the, you know, the statement that they just said to the person. And the person who's not married, very often you'll see that they'll actually become very sad. They don't want to go in public because everybody makes jokes like this. Makes mock and humiliation, putting people down. Someone else will say, oh, you don't have children? That's a big one. Oh, you don't have children? When are you going to get started? When are you going to... As if, you know, having children is in their hands. Again, it's a mocking. It becomes part of our culture. When you have nothing to say, how's the weather? Oh, how come you don't have kids? It's part of the culture to mock. And this is kibir. This is the arrogance, is to humiliate and put people down. 
And again, it might not be that intense, but it's definitely leading on to the kibir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is Fir'aun wa Mala'ihi. There's an interesting um, point about Fir'aun. This issue is um, a lot of people before they want to accept a theory. I figure there's a there's a technical name for this for these type of people. Before they accept a theory, they want to see proof of the results. So, for example, you want to listen to. Of course, you're asking someone who has um, who has experience in something. So you want to ask a person. You know, you want to make a million dollars. Who do you ask? Do you ask the person who has no money? How do you make a million dollars? No, you don't ask this. Right? You ask the person who's made a million dollars already to give you advice. Sometimes the advisors might not necessarily know, they themselves might not necessarily have reached a million dollar status, but they know the techniques of those who have done and they've become expert in how it's done and they can benefit the person. Now, understand this. There is like religious people, though they claim this is religion, they're like, we're not going to follow religion until we see the results of the benefit of that religion. So say, for example, secularists. Secularists, a person who is saying that, you know, let's separate, you know, the masjid from the government, let's separate the church from the government, let's separate any of Allah's laws from the laws that we make. And then they look at the results of this. And they say, the result of this is prosperity. Look at North America. They're like, Alhamdulillah, we uh, separated church and state, or as they say. And look at the results of this. Now, Fir'aun, I want you to understand that this is faulty logic. Because one of the key mistakes that they're making is that they are looking at the results of the present day. Remember that example I told you, the guy who built the castle in Toronto, you can go visit it. How long, if you looked at him, you would have said, this is the true religion. But he lost it nine years later. And then what are you going to say? This is not the true, no, you're not going to say this is not the true religion. You would go jump to someone else who is at the peak of their, of their material gain and think that this is somehow, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding to. It is not the measurement. Is you see, how much Musa, how much money did Fir'aun have in comparison to Musa? Is there any comparison in the money? Like, we're talking about like gold coins here. There's no comparison. Fir'aun had much, 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 much more money than Musa. Who was on the truth? It was Musa alayhi salam. Fir'aun said to his congress, you know, all these gathering of the Mela is all there. And he's saying to them, أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرِ He's like, doesn't the dominion of Misr, the dominion of Egypt, doesn't it belong to me? أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرَ وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارُ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِي أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ he said, doesn't the dominion of Egypt belong to me? And aren't these rivers flowing from underneath me? He's like, it's just flowing from underneath. He's like, أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ Can't you see? It's illogical. I've got the money, so I'm on the truth. And Musa doesn't have the money. So therefore, أَمْ أَنَا And then Fir'aun's continuation, أَمْ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِنْ هَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ مَهِينٌ وَلَا يَكَادُ يُبِينٌ Am I better? Or is this, you know, this uh, low person, maheen, you know, like has no money. <clears throat> Fir'aun, and, and as the scholars mentioned, he arrogantly claimed that the rivers flow from underneath him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the sea flow from on top of him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like he made that statement, Allah azza wa jal punished him and humiliated him in the way that he was claiming that all of these things seem to belong to him. Uh, Musa alayhi salam made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, إِنَّكَ أَتَيْتِ فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلَأَهُ زِينَةً وَأَمْوَالًا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا رَبَّنَا لِيُضِلُّ عَنْ سَبِيلِكَ Musa alayhi salam said, O oh my Lord, إِنَّكَ verily you gave Fir'aun and his uh, mala and his aristocrats, his chiefs, zina, all this glamour, and أَمْوَالًا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا and wealth in this hayat dunya Rabbana, O oh my Lord, and with that money they are misguiding on your, uh, misguiding from your path. Rabbana, fatmis ala, uh, fatmis ala, ala ish, amwalihim, washdid ala kulubihim. 
Uh, Musa alayhi salam said, Oh Allah, that, uh, you know, like to extinguish that wealth that they had and, and, you know, close up, فَلَا يُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى يَرَوُوا الْعَذَابِ الْأَلِيمِ Because they're never going to believe until they see the grievous punishment. When the sea parted for Musa alayhi salam, from Fir'aun's arrogance, when the sea parted, you're wondering, why did Fir'aun continue into the sea? If he saw, he knew, he's, this is Musa, this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sea parted. And Bani Israel was able to escape. Fir'aun, in his arrogance, he said, look, I opened the sea, so that you may chase them and kill them in the sea. And so he told his people to follow them into the sea. Out of his arrogance. And so, and, cause I always wondered this. I said, why did they continue? If they saw the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should stop and hold back, but they didn't. They continued into the sea, and after Bani Israel and, and Musa alayhi salam, after they had left from the sea, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the sea to close down upon them. And close, and Fir'aun, umalahu, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَغْرَقْنَا and from the people and the nations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed, min whom from them Allah drowned them. فمن هم من أغرقنا. From them Allah drowned them. Of these people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed through drowning was Fir'aun and his mela. In conclusion inshallah ta'ala, we'll conclude what is there to protect a person during these times of fitna. Anytime you feel fitna and subhanAllah the story of Musa and Fir'aun is very detailed in the Quran, and there's so many lessons, these issues that we're living in today, the issue of, you know, the issue of terrorism being labeled as terrorist, the issue of, um, uh, people being detained. Bani Israel, you're talking about a whole nation that was detained by Fir'aun. These issues that are coming, the issues of playing propaganda and mixing words and saying this is because of this and that is because of that. All of these things you can learn about it in the story of Musa and Fir'aun and how Musa alayhi salam combated this with, against Fir'aun. The advice Musa alayhi salam gave to his people is the advice that I'm sharing with you right now inshallah ta'ala we conclude with this. قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا he said to his people, "Istainu billah wasbiru." Place your trust in Allah. And we spoke earlier what it means to place your trust in Allah. It is Allah subhanahu wa taala is promising. Hold firmly to this deed, and the conclusion, like nine years later, Allah alam when it'll be, will be for you. So when everybody at the moment something happened on the news, something happened, everybody's flipping and hearts are flipping and everybody's being misguided, and there is no support for the believers. Realize that this moment is going to change and in the end it will be, the reward will be, and the success will be for the believers. Istainu billah wasbiru and be patient. During that time, don't think that these special places in Jannah come to a person just like, you know, majanan. It's not free. It is something very precious with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the person has to work very hard for this. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. We see the way Bani Israel was tested. We haven't been tested anywhere near to the way they were tested. And of course the dua of, the dua of Musa alayhi salam. In all of the, all of these issues, you will see that Musa alayhi salam is raising his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to Allah azza wa jal. And so, there's a verse, this is the last verse, inshallah ta'ala, I'll conclude with this. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That Allah, it is not that Allah would punish them while you are amongst them. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ and Allah will not punish them. The punishment will not come down upon them so long as they continue to ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that ceases, when that comes to an end and the people stop making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stop asking istighfar, they become arrogant and tyrannical, this is when the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes at an appointed time. Jazakumullah khairan. This comes to the conclusion of our parish nations. There's no um, halaqa 
tomorrow, uh, next week. That's it. It's finished. If you'd like to um, learn, actually get the videos for this, if you missed the earlier part, you'd like to get the videos, there's a website that I have. It's called successinislam.com. Success in islam.com if you go on the website you can sign up i send out like a email hadith every week and also on that same list whenever there's like lectures and so on i post the audio uh, i post up the videos or the audios and the notes that i have so you see me I have these notes with me they're printed the word document how can you get a copy of this get on the mailing list inshallah ta'ala success in islam.com